Hello, everyone. Welcome to Science for Staff. Uh, my name is Dan Munich, and I'm a member of the Science for Staff Planning Committee, as well as the Hutch Connect Committee, which sponsors the Science for Staff seminar series. We're very excited to have with us today Dr. Jen Adair from the Clinical Research Division to help us kick off our 2020 season of the seminar series, and this is the start of our third year of the series. We hope you've all been enjoying the past two years. If you've missed any of the, the seminars that have taken place thus far, you can find recordings of them on our Science for Staff page on Centernet. And we have a very exciting uh, few speakers coming up in the next few months, which we'll be announcing um, uh, in the near future. And to help introduce Dr. Adair with us today is Katie Behrens, who is a research administrator in the Clinical Research Division. No, 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 no. <laughs> so I'm still a little perplexed as to why I've been asked to introduce um, today's speaker. I'm not an expert in our field. I'm not good in front of crowds. And I work behind the scenes to manage her grant portfolio. So if this goes sideways, it could be a life lesson for her that managing her grant portfolio is code for managing her grant money. Um, she also asked that I not read from her CV and has given me free reign over this introduction. So here it goes. I transitioned into supporting her grant portfolio um, and lab about three years ago, and it's been an interesting ride to say the least. Her scientific expertise and area of interest were new to me and took some time for me to get used to the lingo. But even today, she'll start explaining some concept or some new data like I know what she's talking about, and I actually don't. <laughs> so these Science for Staff seminars are great because it helps the layperson understand what our scientists do here. So hopefully at the end of this, I will have more insight and can go along with her conversations a bit more. Um, so she keeps me quite busy, and I frequently ask myself, how does she do it all? And despite getting to know her over the past few years, I can't answer that question, but I have learned some things along the way. Number one. She's kind, thoughtful, and compassionate. She seems to know everyone's name on campus, and she will take the time to ask how you're doing no matter how busy she is herself. <clears throat> She's energetic, adventurous, and brave. She accepted a challenge presented to her by her daughter to audition for a role within the Seattle Rep's Public Works Theater program. They each needed to prepare a monologue, a dance, and sing. They both crushed it, and they both were cast in the play. They spent eight weeks over the summer in evening and weekend rehearsals mastering this newfound talent, and their experience culminated in sold out performances and being bitten by the acting bug. I'm pretty sure they're going to do it again, so we will send out the info when that happens. And she's also accepted the challenge to join Luke Timmerman's Everest Base Camp Climb as part of the Climb to, Can Climb to Fight Cancer Initiative and heads to Nepal this March. Three, she is a teacher and a mentor. She will always take the time to give of herself and of the lab to bring anybody in to share the science and what's going on, whether it's SERP students um, or the interns, members of the Boys and Girls Club. And she will lay the foundation with you and help you get to the conclusion and not just give you the answer. She is competitive and passionate. She plays and coaches soccer. She gets extremely animated anytime she's talking about professional sporting events. And after arranging a whirly ball outing, she divided the teams and made it quite clear that anybody on her team needed to win and destroy her opponents. <laughs> she is bright, driven, determined, curious, and innovative. She's constantly thinking of ways to bring her ideas into the lab and drive science forward, and ultimately translating into treatment and or cures for patients worldwide. She's not afraid to think big or to challenge the status quo, for example, her gene therapy in a box. There's a TED talk on it if you wanted to Google that. Her passion, tenacity, and overwhelming desire to make science more accessible and tr treatments accessible, in my opinion, will transform gene therapy as we know it. And I'm excited to see what she's talking about today so I can learn more. And please give a warm welcome to Dr. Jennifer Adair, the new holder of the Fleischauer Family Endowed Chair in Gene Therapy Translation. <laughs> Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. So that was awesome, Katie. Uh, I'm going to flush a little bit now because um, that was a, like more than I could have asked for. 
Um, I just didn't want one of my superior scientists here to tell you all the places I went to school and places I did training. Um, I felt like it would be more meaningful for someone who is in the trenches with me, and Katie has been <laughs> in my trenches sometimes, uh, to give that introduction. So how many of you think that you're sitting in this room to hear a talk about this thing called CRISPR and you are gonna learn a little bit of science and be like, yeah, that was cool. <laughs> Great. How many of you think that you're going to walk out of here having a task list of things that you need to consider regarding CRISPR and feel empowered to actually go after those things? Well, that is the goal <laughs> today. Um, when I was asked to do this, uh, in addition to having someone who knows me on a more personal level give the intro, uh, Guppy suggested that I actually spend one slide at least telling you a little bit more about who I am. Uh, and so I tried to pick some of the things that influence uh, my relationship with science and inspire me every day in the kind of decisions I make about what science I'm going to do and why it's important. So, you may or may not care that I come from the Rust Belt in this tiny little town in between Youngstown and Warren, Ohio called Girard or the Gateway to Trumbull County. None of it looks as pretty as that picture suggests. Uh, anybody here know why it's called the Rust Belt? Steel industry. Steel industry. Not necessarily that it was booming, but it's decline, hence rust. Uh, anybody know when that decline started? I'll give you a hint, the year I was born. <laughs> so the first 21 years of my life that I spent in this city were in an economy that was in sharp decline. Uh, lots of people losing their manufacturing jobs and not really social support to continue them in occupations that were meaningful. And as a result, this area is never really revitalized. And it's why you don't necessarily hear about it much these days. My father, uh, was also a member of the steel industry in this area. Uh, while I was there, my husband hates when I say that I met him when I was 13. So I'm gonna tell you that we started dating when I was 15 in 1995, uh, and we've been married for 22 and a half of the last years in between then and now. Um, part of the reason that I married so young uh, is because I had kids young. Uh, back then, we thought we were doing what we needed to do to prevent kids from happening. Turns out, science 20 years later taught me I'm genetically resistant to some of those methods. I didn't know that at 19 when I found out I was pregnant in undergrad, uh, but we managed. Um, I had two kids while I was doing my undergrad. I, we were on welfare. We both worked while we were going to school. Uh, this brought a lot of perspective to me on things like food insecurity and housing insecurity and all of the struggles that people go through to try and make their space better. Um, you might notice that one of the children in this photo doesn't necessarily resemble the rest of us. Uh, that is our adopted son, Michael. We adopted him here in 2013, and we met him through my volunteer work with Boys and Girls Clubs of King County. Um, this is also something I'm very passionate about, increasing diversity in the sciences. And there's a lot of research to show that the best way to do that is to engage kids in elementary and middle school. So through the Boys and Girls Club, we host a program once a year called Gene Therapist for a Day, uh, where we bring in kids from underrepresented uh, community groups, and they actually get to pretend that they are gene therapists for strawberries. Uh, so you may see us walking around with, with troops of these kids here and there. As Katie mentioned, I'm doing the Everest Base Camp climb. This is me trying to train our new puppy, Ivan. While I'm wearing a low oxygen mask on Tiger Mountain, I figure when I get to Kathmandu and I don't have the dog running everywhere and I don't have to worry about the mask and I have trekking poles, it's gonna be maybe a little easier. Um, but we'll see how that goes. As she mentioned, I am a die-hard soccer fan. I've played since I was five. I have coached since I was had kids, uh, and I refereed. That was actually my first job, uh, was refereeing soccer. And I do get very animated when I'm talking about competitions. And this was a photo that I took while I was crying hysterically at the US Women's World Cup win. I also raised chickens with my daughter because I think the blessing of fresh eggs every morning is there's no better way to start your day. Um, so that's the little bit about me. Let's get back to the topic at hand, CRISPR and why should you care? 
Um, one thing I didn't include on the previous slide, I'm a documentary junkie. Podcasts, nature documentaries, cosmos documentaries, any of these things, I just love to eat them up. And Carl Sagan, who's a famous astronomer, is one of my favorite documentarians on the planet. He said, in 1980, the beginning of the Rust Belt decline, when I was in my formative years, that you have to know the past to understand the present. So in order for me to really tell you what CRISPR means and why it's so important, you have to understand why we got to CRISPR in the first place. And that starts with a very basic high school biology lesson, lesson on what's called the central dogma of all biology. This is a cell, right? It's any cell. It could be a bacteria cell. It could be a yeast cell. It could be a cell in your liver. It could be a cell in your puppy. It could be a cell in a blade of grass. General concept. There's sort of this big structure, the cell membrane, and inside every living cell on the planet is this vault called the nucleus. And in that nucleus is DNA. DNA is the blueprint for whatever the thing is that that cell is making up. It's a complete copy. In a bacteria, that blueprint leads to that one bacterial cell. In a human, the blueprint leads to all of us, even though we have all these different kinds of cells. The reason we have different kinds of cells is because the part of the blueprint that gets used is slightly different in each of those cell types. So in the nucleus, with the DNA, we have these little scribes. They read the DNA, write it down on a little note. We call this the Xerox copy of the DNA, or RNA. And then they convert that into a message that they send out of the vault into another part of the cell called the cytoplasm. This is the construction site, where that little message, that little detail from the blueprint, is going to be read and converted into something useful for the cell called a protein. Central dogma of biology, DNA, RNA, protein. This is how living cells function. It's as simple as that. So, sorry, there's the protein. Gene editing, gene therapy. For as long as we've known about DNA and the central dogma, we've thought about what if we could rewrite the blueprint. Sometimes we have diseases that we're born with because our DNA came with a copy of the blueprint that wasn't exactly describing the right construction. Other times, we might get infected with a virus, like HIV, that adds its own information to the blueprint and corrupts some of our systems that were already working normally. What if we could harness this blueprint to actually have a benefit for human health? And that's the general concept behind gene editing. It was actually first proposed in this issue of science back in 1972, which is before I was born, um, by two authors named Theodore Friedman and Rob Roblin. Now, they had just seen an experiment that was published in another scientific journal where scientists had taken a small piece of DNA that they made in a bacteria, and they put it into some human cells that they were growing in a dish, and they got those cells that were, came from a patient who had an, a genetic disease that involved them not being able to make one particular protein. And they could show that if they put that bacterial DNA in, they could get those cells to make that protein. And this was the first time people said gene therapy might be possible. So Friedman and Roblin said, someday gene therapy might ameliorate some human diseases. But they also said, we should only use this in humans where there's really an unmet need. And we really hope people won't use it in ways that are premature. All of the things they talked about in 1972, before anyone had actually successfully done this, have come to pass. And we're going to go over all of them today because, again, it's important to knowing where we are. Now, something else was happening at the same time this is three years before the Fred Hutch was founded. But E. Donald Thomas and his wife Dottie were already working on bone marrow transplantation. 
They had already expressed this concept. They were getting ready to publish some of the first papers showing that you could take the bone marrow from one person and put it into another person to cure cancer. So Roblin and Friedman said, the first studies of gene therapy should use blood. They should use blood because there's a lot less risk in taking something out and then manipulating the DNA and putting it back in. What they were talking about is if we're going to change the blueprint, we want to make sure that we're changing it in as controlled a way as we can, because probably one of the craziest things we could do is change the blueprint in a sperm or an egg or something that's going to get inherited across generations. So the first trials in gene therapy actually use blood cells. To explain a little bit about how this works, I need to tell you what's going on in your bone marrow. So if you were to take a drop of your bone marrow, Inside, you would see a whole bunch of different cells. We have red blood cells, we have white blood cells, we have platelets, and they all come from one cell at the very top called the stem cell. And the reason bone marrow transplant works is because we're taking the blood stem cells out of one person and putting them in another, into another. Raise your hand if you gave blood before. Okay. How many weeks, months do they make you wait before you can give blood again? Eight weeks, roughly, yeah? Two months, yeah, something like that? They make you wait that long, because that's how long it takes for your blood stem cells to replenish what you gave up. If we took away all your blood stem cells, you would not survive. In human beings, every day, your blood stem cells are cranking out about a billion new blood cells. Some of them only live 24 hours. Some of them live a few months. Others live for decades, like your T cells. This is why you can get vaccinated against something as a child and still have resistance to it later on in your life. So it's a little bit of a complex system. But what gene therapists looked at was, if we could take that therapeutic piece of DNA of blueprint, and we could specifically put it into blood stem cells, then as those blood stem cells divided, that DNA would get carried forward. And essentially, you'd have some therapy that we delivered in the blueprint that would be present for the rest of the person's life, that would divide billions and billions of times, and would circulate throughout their body. That's a really powerful therapeutic approach. For a lot of diseases, it's a one-time treatment that pro provides a lifetime of benefit. Definitely something worth going after. But they had this problem. What those scientists back in the early 1970s had done with the bacterial DNA wasn't going to work in this context. So they had to think about what could we do, what could we use to get therapeutic DNA into blood stem cells? And the answer actually came from nature. Ignore that picture for one second. Animation out of order. It didn't come from Hans Peter Kim, I promise. <laughs> it came from the picture on the other side. <laughs> the engineered virus particle. See, we all make mistakes sometimes engineered viruses. Viruses like HIV had already figured out how to transmit their piece of the blueprint into our DNA. Why don't we just co-opt the machinery that they've already figured out? Only instead of HIV virus DNA, we'll replace it with a piece of helpful DNA. So they had to engineer the virus particles to figure out how to get this to work. But it had already been shown. This was being done in dishes and in animal models before I was finishing graduate school. In 2005, I went to North Carolina to do something else in my first postdoc. Um, but I was coaxed to come back here in 2008 by Hans-Peter Kim, who had basically developed about three different gene therapies for blood stem cells using engineered viruses, one to treat cancer, one to treat inherited diseases, and one to treat infectious diseases like HIV. And they had done a lot of animal studies, and they had done a lot of safety work. And what they needed was to figure out how are we actually going to take this from where it is in the lab right now to a patient over at the SCCA or at the UW? And that is called translation, translating it from the bench to the bedside. I am not an MD. I have a PhD. But this awesome job that got me standing in front of you today was really facilitated, ignore that, by this guy, Dr. Brian Beard. Has anybody been here long enough to remember Brian? Joan. Brian and I went to graduate school together at Wazoo. 
He was my two year ahead of me in the program graduate mentor when I was doing my PhD. We became really good friends and he's actually the godfather to my daughter. Brian had come to work with Hans Peter and had developed these gene therapies. He, for totally unrelated reasons, came to North Carolina to see the family and how everyone was doing. And he said, well, what are you doing with your scientific life? And I said, I don't know. I feel like I really want to do something that meaningfully impacts patient well-being, but I don't have an MD. And he said, holy smokes, we, we need someone who can understand the science of what we're doing that wants to understand how it's going to help people to really navigate this process. So he came, told Hans Peter. Hans Peter called me on Monday and said, you don't have any of the experience that we're looking for. I said, you're right. And he said, but Brian spoke very highly of you. And I honestly am at the end of my rope figuring out how we're going to do this. So I'll make you a deal. Move your family from North Carolina to Seattle for two years. And if you can figure out how to do this in patience, by the end of that two-year period, then maybe we can talk about like future plans as maybe a clinical research associate or someone who's going to go to industry and run clinical trials there. Or maybe you could go to one of these gene therapy companies that's coming out and help them figure out how to take gene therapy into the clinic. So I came. And in six months, Brian and I, working together really a lot, developed what you're about to see, which is ex vivo blood stem cell gene therapy in a nutshell, okay? So it starts with a patient coming into the clinic. And we collect either their bone marrow or their blood. We then take it here to the therapeutic product production facility. Anybody here from TPP? No? Maybe they're streaming. <laughs> so we take it to this clean lab. Now, this is not like the labs you walk by on the first floor of Thomas. This is in the basement. This is what it looks like when we work in there. Uh, it's really important that you don't accidentally mix patient A cells with patient B cells. So in these facilities, if you are going to be doing this kind of work, you have to have a separate piece of equipment for every patient that you're processing at any given time. You also have to have three people. One who reads the directions, one who does the directions, and one who watches and makes sure that the direction that was read is the direction that was done. And those of you who, like Katie, manage grant portfolios know that personnel costs are a lot. So you can imagine what this kind of procedure might cost to do. What these people are doing are preparing the blood to get the cells we want. It turns out, if we just add the engineered viruses to these blood products, we'll never hit enough of the stem cells that we want, or the T cells if we're doing immunotherapy. It's the same kind of process that happens when you're doing CAR T cell therapy. So we have to use this special equipment. We run the blood through it, and what comes out are the cells that we want. This may seem like science fiction is actually a super simple concept. Each of these cells that we want has a special protein on the surface that makes it unique. T cells have a specific T cell protein. Stem cells have a specific stem cell protein. We know about antibodies, other proteins that can bind to specific proteins. So someone thought this idea of taking an antibody to the T cell or the stem cell specific protein and putting it on a metal bead, incubating them together so only the metal beads and the antibodies stick to the cells you want. And then they just turn on a big magnet. And everything with a metal bead sticks and everything else goes through. That's all that machine does, right? Once we've got those cells, we have to keep them happy. If we just took your blood out and left it on the floor, it would not be happy. We have to fool it into thinking that it's still inside your body. Same body temperature, same level of carbon dioxide, same level of water, all of those things. We call this culturing, incubators, growth factors, media, maybe some things you've heard of before. And then when we've got the cells happy, we can add the engineered virus particles. And we basically just pipe it in, add in these virus particles. And the goal is that they add one copy of the therapeutic piece of DNA that we want into the DNA of the cells that are in our dish. But fun fact, we have no control over where it goes. We also have no control over whether it goes in once 
or 10 times. Now, you might think, well, if you add 10 copies, that could be a lot more therapeutic than only adding one. But because we can't control where it goes, every time we add one, we raise the risk that maybe we're doing something to the DNA that's really going to screw up the blueprint. And so we had to fine tune the conditions to get the Goldilocks zone, right? As many cells as we could with just one or two copies and not 10. And this is different whether it's T cells or stem cells. Then we got to make sure we haven't contaminated them with bacteria that you don't want to go back into the patient, that they're doing the things that we're supposed to do, that they're still stem cells or still T cells, and that they're going to be ready to function when they go back into the patient. And then and only then do they go back to the SCCA and get infused. Now, as crazy as this sounds, it's working for lots of different diseases right now. Incredible potential. Cancer, infectious diseases, genetic diseases of multiple types. Thousands of patients right now being treated in clinical trials or early after FDA approval of certain therapies. And with that potential comes industry's potential for great profit. I thought it would be useful to put this up here. 100 million patients, $2 billion industry in the next three years. This is just a handful a handful of the companies that have already formed around this concept of gene therapy. And this is the product, the first three FDA approvals, two in 2017, one in 2018, more on the way. But why do you think I chose these particular headlines? They all include a price tag. Look at that cost. Some of our insurance wouldn't approve that, right? No healthcare system can sustain that. Lux Turnus for a rare inherited form of blindness. Zolgensma is for a pretty rare genetic disease that causes neurodegeneration in babies. Pioneering cancer drug is CAR T cell therapy developed here. Okay? What happens when we design gene therapy to treat HIV? Well, let's think about that for a second. This is the worldwide prevalence, darker blue, more persons living with HIV in that area. Let's look at all of the clinics in the world right now that can do gene therapy. Notice anything? Big problem, right? Sickle cell disease, NIH just announced, big initiative. We're going to use gene therapy, gene editing to cure sickle cell disease. Well, guess where more patients in the world are born with sickle cell disease every year than in the rest of the world combined? Nigeria. Average middle class family income, about 500 US dollars a month. Average amount they spend per year on health care, $171. This is not going to work in these places. So in 2014, we had launched five different clinical style trials of blood stem cell gene therapy here for a lot of different diseases. And I was really worried about this gap. I got offers to go to a couple of other institutions, and Ollie Press, who was the interim director at the time, said, could we get you to stay here and work on this as a faculty member? And I said, sure. So first project. This is our process. It's not going to work. It's too expensive. It's too complicated. We can't build these facilities in Africa. Let's, let's deal with that first. So I started looking. Is there any way that I can make everything that happens in this circle portable? And the answer came from a commercially available technology. This is a device that someone built. It's the next generation version of the big magnet that I told you about on the previous slide. Same company. And what they did was automate the steps up front, the preparation part. But in theory, this machine had the capability to do each of the things that need to happen in the rest of the process. We just had to tell it when to do them, how to do them. And we had to add virus so that virus could also go in. And we had to tell it that it could actually make cells happy like an incubator could. And we did that in two years. It was a big study that was published in 2016 in a really fantastic journal called Nature Communications. It was this prototype. Gene therapy in a box, still sitting in my lab, two hallways down. You're welcome to come see it anytime if you'd like. 
It's being used right now in lots of CAR, detail, CAR T cell trials. But it's not being used for blood stem cell gene therapy, and it's not as widely portable as we thought for one very important reason. We cannot make enough engineered virus particles to treat thousands of patients. It takes six months, a quarter of a million dollars, to make enough to treat 10 to 20. So it's great that we have this machine. It's great that it's portable. We're never going to be able to do it with virus particles. So we started thinking, what are some possible solutions to this problem? And there are really two that I could think of. Either we make those engineered viruses so efficient at delivering their DNA that we don't need as much of them. So then the same batch might get us 200 patients instead of just 20. Or we find an alternative. How many of you like to admit that you have no idea where you're going and completely change directions and have to learn a whole bunch of new stuff? Lies, all of you lies. <laughs> I'm the same way, so of course I went after number one. I know viruses, I know this system, I can make this work, right? Problem, I already told you, we can't control where it goes or how many times. Turns out when you try to make it more efficient, you just get more copies in and guess what that leads to? Cancer, not good, right? Right, <laughs> so, I needed this sort of slap in the face to help me realize that I needed to suck it up and change directions and look at something else. Well, lucky for me, for the last few years, this awesome technology was being discovered called CRISPR. So what is this? Well, the discovery of CRISPR actually started back in 1987, when researchers were looking at bacteria in a dish and they were specifically looking at the DNA in that bacteria. And they noticed that there were patterns in that DNA that just did not really make sense. There were these repeated codes with spaces in between them that did not make proteins. It took them 18 years to figure out. Bacteria also get infected by viruses that try to hijack their blueprint. Bacteria have developed their own immune system, and it is CRISPR. So CRISPR would store a little bit of that virus DNA in its own DNA, so that if the same virus ever came back in, it could use the message, the RNA from that piece, to cut up the new virus that came in. It's a two-part system, the RNA piece that's going to match the virus DNA, and a protein piece that's going to actually do the cutting up. I grabbed my lightsaber a second ago. This is the protein. This blue piece is the piece of RNA. And what it's doing right here is it's binding to some DNA. We can imagine that's virus DNA. And if it matches the RNA, yes, this is a virus I've seen before. Cut, 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 cut with these scissors. Fascinating. Instantly, as soon as it was realized that this was an immune system and that it had the capability of cutting these specific pieces of DNA based on the RNA that was there, people went, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, wait. We can make proteins from bacteria. We've been doing that for a long, long time. We also can synthesize RNA in any code we want in a test tube. Could we purify this protein and could we add RNA, I don't know, that matches human DNA? and get the same cutting to happen? And the answer was yes. So then they tried it in other types of DNA, bacterial, yeast, fruit, vegetable, animal, anything that has a blueprint, this system works in. So what happens? You get a cut, so what, right? You get a cut. Well, it turns out that our DNA and the DNA of plants and the DNA of animals and the DNA of bacteria and yeast get cut all the time. Every day, your DNA is getting cut because you breathe oxygen, which actually can facilitate cuts in your DNA. Our cells have evolved to have little correction pathways to manage this. So you make a cut. Sometimes you get a mutation, a change in the code that can destroy part of the blueprint. 
This could be useful if the part of the blueprint is driving cancer and you don't want it to be on. It could be useful if you don't understand what that part of the blueprint is doing and you want to study it, see what happens when you turn it off. It could also be important if you want to change the blueprint because you know that some disease exists where changes are made in this part of the DNA and you want to understand what happens. But we also know that if we provide a little piece of DNA that has some parts that match where we made the cut and maybe some new information, we can get that to insert exactly where we made the cut and we can very precisely rewrite our own blueprint. This is where CRISPR exploded in 2013. I'm talking a lot about the stuff that I'm doing with CRISPR, which is RNA and protein in its simplest form with DNA to do this. I'm not the only one. Last 18 months, these are all scientific papers out of Fred Hutch using CRISPR. It is completely transforming how we think about our blueprint. Harmit just published yesterday, super cool study. Yeah, bacteria develop CRISPR to fight viruses that infect them. But guess what? Viruses are fighting back. They developed an anti-CRISPR. How cool is that? Rob Bradley said, I want to study the evolution. Why do we have some genes in our DNA that are exactly the same as genes in mice and fruit flies? Why? So he used CRISPR to make cuts, to knock things out. And it turns out they're really important for developing how complex we are versus mice and fruit flies, and also for preventing cancer, something that we definitely care about here. Mike Emmerman, Julie Overbaugh, working to figure out, using CRISPR, how HIV is evolving so quickly. Fun fact, HIV jumped from monkeys to people in 1908. It's the fastest evolving virus on the planet that we know about. CRISPR is helping us figure out how it's doing that, and how we can potentially stop it. Keith Jerome and Hans Peter, using CRISPR to attack the HIV DNA that's already hijacked our blueprint. Take an infected person, find the cells that have those pieces of virus DNA, get rid of them. Justin Taylor, I talked about B cells, uh, antibodies that we have to fight infection. Those come from a type of cell called the B cell. We don't really have too much control. You either have to be vaccinated or you've got to be able to um, be exposed to something in the environment in order for you to develop antibodies against it. Justin's figured out how to use CRISPR to hijack our B cells to make exactly the antibodies we need when we need them before an infection gets out of control. Roland and Hans Peter working on CRISPR as a treatment for acute myeloid leukemia in patients who are already going to be undergoing bone marrow transplant. And Hans Peter earlier this year, CRISPR to introduce a mutation that could cure sickle cell disease. Just came out. This is every division here at our center. People that you may recognize, lots of things going on. We are capitalizing on the possibilities for CRISPR to better understand and treat human disease. But let's get back to why I cared about CRISPR. CRISPR versus engineered viruses. Have I found my alternative for my process? Two or three parts. You need that protein in the RNA. If you want to rewrite a change precisely, you need some DNA. All of these molecules we can make pretty easily. Engineered virus particles. Can't make them in a test tube. You have to have a living cell put them together for you, which is why they're so hard to make and so expensive. What does that mean? We can make CRISPR very cheaply in a mass production sort of format, we cannot make engineered viruses that way. We can target specific places in the DNA with CRISPR. We can't do that with engineered viruses. All pluses so far, check, 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 problem. CRISPR is a bacterial protein. Why would human cells ever say, come on in? That would be dumb. Viruses have already figured out how to get into cells naturally. CRISPR, no. 
So researchers, not me, lots of people, who had already looked at our process, that big wheel of things we have to do for blood cell gene therapy outside the body, and they started figuring out how can we add CRISPR instead of viruses in here. And right now, there are at least six clinical trials happening that are using this process, which is even more complicated. So you just put CRISPR in, nothing happens to the cells. To get the cells to take it up, you have to be pretty aggressive. In this case, you electrocute them. Small electric shock sort of makes them go, and they suck some stuff in, and that's how we deliver it. Now, that works for getting the RNA and the protein piece in, but it turns out it's not as easy to get the DNA part in if you want to add that. So guess what people relied on to get the DNA part in? Engineered virus particle. Dun, dun, dun. So, <laughs> we haven't figured it out yet, right? So when I came into CRISPR, this had already been figured out. People were starting to do it. And I'm looking at this going, never going to work in so many parts of the world. If I want to put it in my gene therapy in a box device, I need to be able to just add it and have it do what it needs to do. I also started thinking about whether or not gene therapy in a box was really ever going to work in some of the places on that global map that I just showed you. Now, you know that we have a Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center satellite in Kampala, Africa. We were talking about what it takes for families to get there, and there was a particular story that came out in the Hutch News about a young mother and her child with Burkitt lymphoma who were trying to get to this clinic for treatment. And it took them two months to raise the seven US dollars to ride with a baby on the back of a motorcycle to this clinic, and they couldn't even find out if they were going to be treated until they got proof that it was the type of cancer that they were willing to treat at that center. They had no money for food. They didn't have a place to stay. They slept on the floor in the hospital hallway. And they had no idea if they were found to not have that cancer how they were going to afford to actually go back. Even gene therapy in a box takes several days. That is also not going to work. If we really want to think big picture how this type of therapy is going to get to those places, it needs to be a super affordable single office visit that takes only a few hours. And the only way we're going to do that is if we can deliver it in a syringe. So in 2015, after I figured out gene therapy in a box was not going to be the answer that I was looking for, I started thinking about this. And I, like I said before, didn't want to massively change direction, so I started thinking of all these complex processes and pathways, and then one day I was like, you know what, I just need to take a step back, take a look at my whiteboard, blank. And I need to write down what are the, like, simplest things we need to be able to do for this to be a reality. First on my list, I got to be able to get CRISPR into cells without electrocuting them. We can never do that in a person. <laughs> if I can't do that, I'm not sure how we're going to start this. I'll have to re rewrite my, my personal goals here. But if I could do that, OK, so I could passively get it to go into cells. Well, I need to make sure that when I put it in the body, it will go to the cells that I want it to go to. Again, not sperm and egg. I don't want to give a blood cell gene therapy to the liver, because that's not useful. I need it to go to the bone marrow, and then I need it to find the stem cells. Or I need it to go to the thymus and find the T cells. And last but not least, it's got to be safe. Right? If we can't show it's safe, then we're not going to do it. So after some soul searching, I thought, maybe nanoparticles. This is a fun little bioengineering field that I had zero experience in when I started looking at it. These are tiny, tiny little things, one billionth the size of a single grain of table salt. We have them in our body all the time. Sometimes our cells make their own. Um, they exist in nature. And lots of biochemical engineers were working on these things. I figured out there were sort of three flavors, proteins. These are like little cotton ball poofs with little surprises stuffed inside. 
These are lipoplexes. They're made of fats. They form a little like sphere that traps things in it that can get taken up by our cells. And then there was this third kind where they would create these tiny, tiny, tiny metal balls and attach things to the surface. And that's actually the same technology that's used for the antibodies and the magnet separation that I told you about earlier. So first project, I said, I'm just going to go in order left to right. We'll start with polyplexes. I happened to know someone at the University of Minnesota who was working on these things. So I called her and I said, would you want to do a project with me? And she said, sure. And guess what? You got to be able to get RNA protein and or DNA in. We could not get all three of those things into our magic little poofs. And when we added the magic little poofs to the blood stem cells in a dish, they died. Not going to work. Now serendipitously, and I see him sitting right in the middle in the back in front of the podium. In late 2016, I got one of those uh, cold emails from a graduate student in Turkey named Dr. Reza Shabasi, who was interested in coming to the US. And he was really interested in applying his expertise in gold nanoparticles to deliver cancer therapies. And I work at a cancer center. Uh, and I like to say I'm approachable. so. He thought he'd cold email me and just see if there was a chance. So I emailed him back and said, well, how would you feel about maybe doing this with CRISPR? And he came up with what I thought was a pretty brilliant idea for how gold nanoparticles could carry protein and RNA and DNA all at one time. And as the spoiler alert shows you, it kind of works. And it looks like this. This is the little gold balls in solution using a super high-powered microscope that we have here down in scientific imaging before we put anything on them. And this is what it looks like when they're all done. We added the RNA first. When you add the RNA and you put the protein in solution, they just naturally form their little complex together. This was important because when you have to change proteins to get them to attach to stuff, sometimes you change what they're able to do. And we wanted to not have to do that. And other people had shown that you could change the RNA on one end and it would still work fine. So that's what we did. Then we had a problem. We said, well, this is fine if we just want to make those cuts and mutations, but sometimes we want to add DNA. This particle, very negative. DNA, also negative. It's like putting the same poles of a magnet together. They repel. So Reza had this idea. Well, why don't we? take one of those little magic poofs, uh, one that happens to be super positively charged. This is already negative. It's going to just right to the surface. And then there'll be these little positive bits sticking up. And that might be enough for us to get negative DNA to just sit in there. And he was correct. So we asked, can we put this on cells? Will they all die? They didn't. So we said, OK, do the cells take up the particle? They do. All right, so we got them in the cytoplasm. Can we get them in the nucleus? And do they actually make changes in the DNA? They do. And we actually showed that we could make the same change that's being used to test gene editing to treat HIV. And we could also make the change that's being used in the treatment of sickle cell disease that I just talked about from Hans Peter's lab. The two diseases that we were already thinking about on a really global scale. So now we've got something that maybe will get us here. I don't know the answer yet. It's step one. And guess what? It works, but it doesn't quite work well enough that we feel really confident it's going to have a super, super positive impact in the blood cells of these patients. So we still have more work to do. We got to get to this next step, too, same time. So fortunately, the same day that our paper came out, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation said, we share the same dream. Let's work on this together. And we were very fortunate to be the recipients of an investment award from them in September. And this is the question we're starting to go after. Hopefully, my next Science for Staff talk will be on a really cool idea I have right now. But I have zero idea if it's going to pan out on how we could actually do this. And we still need to show that all of this is safe. So we still have a long way to go, but we're getting there one step at a time. And the more stuff like this that we do, the more it makes other people think about other ways that maybe we could accomplish these goals. And for me, 
The important part is that we get here and we benefit human health. And that's really bringing up sort of the last part of this talk, which is going to be the part where you all start to really care. Okay? So how many of you, before you saw my flyer, heard of CRISPR? That's great. How many of you heard of it because of this movie? How many of you have seen this movie? Just a couple people? I don't know why this movie was so wildly unpopular. Um, this was a video game that I used to go in the 80s and play in the arcade, where you get to be this little guy, and you have to fight off a giant crocodile, a giant wolf, and a giant gorilla from a, like destroying Chicago. And so since people of my generation are sort of the prime earners right now, they decided to give this a cinematic spin, put the rock in it. But they had to come up with some screenplay idea for how we could possibly ever get to a giant crocodile, giant wolf, and a giant gorilla, and they decided CRISPR was the way to go. <laughs> this is from the summary on Wikipedia. She wanted to create treatments for diseases. Found out the company she was working for was using CRISPR to develop biological warfare doesn't say it here. She tried to expose them, they caught her, and they had her falsely imprisoned. Right? Crazy story. But it turns out, you change just a few words, and you have something that actually just happened this year. Hei Zhongkui. Right? Young Chinese scientist, just got fined three million US dollars and is gonna spend the next three years in prison along with two of the people in his lab, because he genetically edited using CRISPR unborn embryos, implanted them, and allowed those children to be born. Before we understand what the risks associated are. Now, he has totally been vilified by the media. But I'd like to point out a couple of things about this case. One, there has been zero transparency in any of the investigations, OK? Two. If you look at the five years prior to this gene editing of the embryos in a dish incident, you'll see that he, like me, was a young aspiring scientist in the gene therapy field. He had just finished his postdoc. He's trying to write good papers. He's trying to get good funding, all the same things that I would want to do. He got a job at a university in California that wasn't actually able to support the kind of research he wanted to develop. And then someone from China walked in with this government-sponsored plan called the Peacock Plan, which was designed to bring new and great scientists back to China. It's a brand new institute. You think about how many processes we have in place for IRB, like IACUC, all these things that review whether or not we're doing things safely in humans or animals. And this is a brand new institution that's never set those things up or had them operating or had to deal with the kinds of things that come up in those reviews. And they gave him a ton of money and a single task. Make us a name in CRISPR gene editing. Now you think about that, and I think about the pressure I feel as a young PI to be successful in my job, and it's a recipe for disaster. And guess what? He gets painted as this rogue who did it alone in his little lab. Not true. There were US scientists involved. They have video of them in the room when the patients were being consented. There were lots of people he talked to about what he was thinking about doing and what he was planning to do before he actually did it. And guess what all of those people did when his announcement was like, oh no. They went, not me. I didn't have any part in that. Turned tail and ran. In my opinion, it would be better if we all just said, we all did wrong. Not just a handful of people, all of us. Yes, he crossed some ethical lines. Those children are born. If they reproduce, those changes are going everywhere they go. The idea is that he just rerouted human evolution. Why was it not blatantly obvious that this was not OK right now? And the answer is not because one young, naive scientist under pressure didn't know. It's because the entire culture has not thought about what lines do we need to draw right now 
to make sure that we don't cross these thresholds yet or ever. So everyone together has to think about these things. One of the most important things is talking to the public and being open. It's an awesome system. We're going to learn so much. But it could definitely go awry. And how are the ways that that could happen? I'm going to tell you a story about 2011 when this movie came out. I was still in Hans Peter's lab. We were developing gene therapy to treat HIV. It came from monkeys, so of course we're testing our therapies in monkeys. I'm very transparent with my family. And those kids I showed you early, they're now in middle school. We're sitting in a packed theater on opening night in the middle of this film, and guess what led to the rise of the Planet of the Apes? Gene therapy to treat Alzheimer's, according to that screenplay. And my 10-year-old stands up right about where you are in the middle of the theater and goes, gene therapy and monkeys, my mom does that! <laughs> And I went, shit. <laughs> like, hello? Why did he have that reaction? How do I not have him have that reaction? How do we have normal discussions about this? And how do I make announcements like that not shock a theater so that people get up and move away from me or give me a wide berth when we leave? And that's when I started thinking about how I was actually going to talk to everyone about the power of gene therapy, but also the risks. We're not that far from deciding that our evolution would be better off if we perfected the human genome. Also covered in a science fiction film back in 1997, which happens to be one of my favorite movies. I saw this when I was in high school, and it influenced my decision to go into genetics when I decided to become a scientist. Really, really awesome. But remember that part where I told you that CRISPR's been tested in a lot of different cell types, anything that has a blueprint. More than our evolution is at stake. Livestock, agriculture, bacteria, viruses, biological warfare. Oh, crap. Dang, it just got heavy in here, didn't it? We have to talk about this stuff. Because if we just ignore it, it will just happen, and we will have had no say in it happening. And it will start influencing us, and we will have no control over that. Now, you might think, I don't know enough, I'm not a scientist, but every one of you in this room has two of the most important tools that anyone can use in the fight against making sure that our culture is transparent, accessible, and accountable. Your dollar and your vote. I'm not telling you which way to go with either. Each one of you has to make that own decision for yourself. But I can tell you that when I participated in the Women's March in 2017, my favorite sign of that entire march was this one. Whether you agree or not, CRISPR is happening, and we're all in it together. So we can come to the table and have these kinds of discussions. We could think about the ways that each one of us might gatekeep in our day-to-day -day lives to affect the kind of CRISPR applications that we want. And you do all have the power to make those decisions. So in my opinion, if you want a little more guidance than that, I would say think about these kinds of general concepts. Where should we apply it? Places where we have really unmet needs and where the risk to benefit ratio is in favor of the benefit and not so much the risk. Number two, who should have access? Anyone who meets the criteria, number one. Number three, who should administer these? Nobody that developed it and nobody who's got a financial interest in whether or not it works, period. Third parties who have no stake in whether or not it's successful are the most objective opinions in whether or not this stuff actually meets the criteria in one and two. Which studies should face the public? All of them. We need to be able to talk about not just what worked, but what didn't, and be open about that. Why have five groups making the same mistakes when if we just talked about them, we could all avoid them? And last but not least, who should know about it? Everyone. 
And that's the last place you guys have to gatekeep. Tell everybody how awesome this talk was today and tell them to watch the live stream so that they can start thinking about ways that it might impact their day-to-day -day life. Katie promised me that she wouldn't get mad if I put this photo in there. <laughs> that's a lie. She actually told me right before we walked in, do not use the whirly ball photo, and it was too late. It was already in the slides. <laughs> Two years ago, I finally had enough money to take my lab on a summer adventure, and they wanted to go kayaking, and two of them almost drowned, and so now we do whirly ball. <laughs> <laughs> and I absolutely did tell my team that they had to win <laughs> uh, in this endeavor. Katie makes my day-to-day -day life go in so many ways that I'm incredibly thankful for that extend far beyond the introduction that she gave me today. My lab on the left, it's all sitting right up there. Raise your hands, guys. I want people to come at you, too. <laughs> awesome lab. TPP, all of the offices here that have helped me. My mentoring committee, definitely Hans Peter's lab, where I got my start here at Fred Hutch. Beyond that, I just want to throw in a couple of last plugs. I mentioned at the beginning that I think a lot about personal resources and my time on welfare, and it impacts me. One of my initiatives this year is getting the Hutch to realize that the rising housing costs in our city are not amenable to a lot of the staff who work here. And you all just got an email about a housing survey this week. Even if you don't think you're in that category of people who are going to be hurt by the housing costs rising, answer the survey, because it's really important for us to identify gaps. Be transparent and participate, and that's how we will make progress. People who don't have housing insecurity will be able to answer some of the scientific questions that we're trying to address here much more easily. So let's work on that together, too. And I'm over, and I'm sorry, so thank you for your attention, and I appreciate everyone being here. So I'll stay for questions, but you're not obligated to stay in your seats at all. Or you can just leave. That's fine, too. <laughs> yes? So while you're working on the injection site, an injection solution, are there other local orgs, like Partners in Health, that we could at least do the, um, the virus box thing where Yeah, so the question was, uh, since we have gene therapy in a box, can we already hit the ground running in some of these more um, disparate regions of the globe where we might have places like our uh, partners, like Partners in Health or other global resource um, initiatives? And the answer is yes, in theory. The answer is no, because there is actually uh, currently a dispute over whether or not the company that made that machine or I actually own that device. That's a really crappy answer, but it's the reality. So it's being used in a lot of industrial settings right now uh, in order for us to be able to give it away in the way that we need to, to partner with some of those organizations. We have to get through that litigation first. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, and I see a lot of, uh, it looks like your gene therapy in a box machines sitting in the self-processing facility. They are there. Why are they sitting there if they don't need to be? So those are actually being used for other things. So once we published that you could reprogram and repurpose that device for different types of things like gene therapy, other people wanted to use it in their own way. And not all of those ways are compatible with being out in the lab. Um, plus, when you think about actually doing this in patients, even though we've proven that they don't need to be in there, I think everyone just sort of goes, let's just leave them in there for now until we absolutely don't have to. Yes? Um, you mentioned the importance of kind of building on gene therapy issues. Are, are you aware of any like current or pending legislation that would benefit from that front, like locally or nationally? No. <laughs> That's a, it's a crappy answer, but you know, I think right now, um, and I'm totally blanking, maybe someone in here remembers, there is an initiative to put more scientists in office called uh, Initiative 501 or something like that. I can look it up and um, send it out. 
Um, look at those candidates, look at their platforms, and then think about if they're relevant to any offices that you do have the power to vote for, whether or not ideals align. Um, you know, not every politician's gonna even remotely talk about CRISPR. Um, part of the history of that gene editing the embryos that I talked about is that, you know, that happened in 2017, the baby's birth was in 2018, that's when all the crap hit the fan. But the US gene therapy experts got together in 2015 to set recommendations and they did not say, do not do this. They gave a set of criteria and it was super vague and open to interpretation and guess what happened? It was interpreted. This has been a subject of a lot of discussion right now. You know, thinking about how do we change that? Um, I think it's just important to think about not just the candidates that you're voting for, um, but initiatives when they come up. Um, you know, back when I first became eligible to vote, uh, there was an initiative in the state of Ohio on whether or not insurance companies could have access to genetic information because we sequenced the first human genome in the year 2000. And there was a lot of controversy over what they were gonna do with that information. There are some great documentaries on whether or not if you participate in 23andMe, you own your own genetic information. Just like, do you own your own cell phone data, right? Um, I think it's just important to think about these things and then you'll start to recognize as you learn more, so much we miss just because we don't think we need to think about it or it's just outside of the scope of our lingo, something like that. Um, I put those movies up there because they're a great tool to talk about. That was, you know, I watched Rampage and talked about CRISPR with my kids before the Chinese scientists did this and it was shocking to me how close they were to hitting the storyline. Um, I think just increasing conversations about this stuff is probably the first step. And if I think of any places where there are important votes, we actually have a government issues office here and they do a really good job of figuring out which things need to be voted on in which particular way or if you wanna make a decision about this stuff and uh, Guppy would be the one. 314 Action. There we go. Yeah, 314 Action is the one that's trying to put more scientists in political offices. Thank you.